Um, in this presentation, I'll be discussing four different contemporary issues in sport, and those are drugs, gender, violence, and education. So there are many different types of drugs within sports, and each of them has a different effect on the body. Stimulants can aid to increase reaction time and can come in the forms of cocaine, amphetamine and even caffeine. Although caffeine isn't actually a banned substance, but the amount an athlete can take is monitored. Drugs such as anabolic steroids help to build muscle and bones, which will benefit an athlete's power. Um, relaxants such as alcohol and beta blockers slow down the heart rate and steady their hand. So this would be useful for an athlete like an archer, as it makes their hands less shaky. Some drugs such as diuretics and plasma expanders are used in order to cover up the fact that an athlete has taken drugs in the first place so that it doesn't show up on their drugs test. Um, drugs such as diuretics allow athletes to lose weight through urination, particularly this would be popular in boxing as they need to fall into a certain weight category. Um, some drugs such as EPO or blood doping increase oxygen delivery which would benefit an endurance athlete as it would delay the effects of fatigue. Some drugs such as narcotics and ACTH work to mask pain, so for example maybe um, a boxer or a rugby player would use this as it um, would mask the pain that they're in which would allow them to push themselves further and keep on training. So there's different reasons why someone might choose to take drugs in the first place. So it could be for physiological reasons, psychological or social reasons. So physiologically you can now and that allow an athlete to build muscle, increase energy, increase oxygen transport, lose weight, train harder and longer to improve further, mask injury and reduce tiredness. Physiologically it can allow an athlete to steady their nerves, control their arousal and to get them into the optimum zone mentally. Um, psychologically it's going to increase their confidence, um, potentially increase their aggression through roid rage which could obviously um, give them the edge in the event and it can also increase their motivation um, obviously socially it can help an athlete if they're under a lot of pressure from coaches and sponsors it can help to calm them and ensure that they perform well and don't let anyone down um, it can help them to get money and endorsements from winning that's providing they don't get caught and obviously some athletes are just scared of losing so they have the mentality of winning at all costs and um, obviously because a lot of athletes are doing it nowadays some athletes I uh, kind of think it's just okay to do it because it's become the norm. Um, obviously, athletes on performing enhancing drugs will often put on a more entertaining show for spectators as they're more confident and performing better. So that's a, a bonus for the spectators to watch. Additionally, there aren't currently many deterrents in place with regards to perform, performing enhancing drugs. Um, so there's nothing really in place to make them want to stop. So other reasons why they might do it is just to look good because obviously it can help with the muscle building and stuff. And also drug testing currently isn't too effective so that's not going to worry people too much. So yeah. However, on the against side, a lot of people believe that it should be about skill and fitness when it comes to sport and instead of all this extra influence. And obviously some drugs can become addictive um, some people actually manipulate manipulated um, into taking drugs by coaches and fellow athletes so it's not necessarily a conscious decision that they would have made by themselves and obviously there's the the saying that some people think that if you made it available for everyone then it's still a um, a fair ground for everyone but obviously poorer countries and athletes would not be able to afford the same drugs there's still not really a level playing field for them and obviously in the Olympics they have the oath uh, in regards to that everyone will play fair like by the rules there's going to be no cheating it's all going to be their own effort so that would just be completely disregarded. Um, obviously if you've got role models for younger children and they see them taking performance enhancing drugs they might think it's a good way and it could be a gateway to taking um, normal drugs that could damage their health. So Floyd Landis was a cyclist and he was um, he was caught taking drugs and um, he was stripped of his Tour de France title in 2010 and he also lost a three million dollar sponsorship so it just kind of shows how big a consequence you can face so obviously people lose their jobs, they drop from sponsorships, oh, their reputation is completely ruined, then they turn into a bad role model so parents won't want their kids looking up to them 
and obviously the medical implications like it can physically do you damage so some of the solutions are putting more money into labs for testing um, actually naming and shaming the athletes so people know who's doing it and who isn't obviously the education factor is always good as um, it can tell people about the kind of impact they're putting their body through um, yeah biological passports are currently present in certain um, athletic events where um, the more common results for that athlete's tests are put in so that way if they're being tested and they get a completely um, obscure kind of result then they will give them an inclination that they're probably on some kind of performance enhancing drugs and there's a number of anti-doping agencies um, such as the World Anti-Doping Agency, UK Sport, British Olympic Association, UK Anti-Doping and National Governing Bodies. So there's gender in sport. Um, so obviously typically in sport you kind of think of uh, the more manly sports I suppose. Um, yeah, and sports just always, uh, I guess historically, been um, kind of more aimed towards men. Um, and obviously you've got certain stereotypes of in sports that um, male dominated sports such as rugby and football and basketball you've got to kind of be strong and tough to do it and then the more female orientated sports such as netball, gymnastics and dance so there's kind of no contact and yeah so why does it exist? obviously gender roles have uh, play a big issue and obviously there are some physiological differences between men and women making them different um, and kind of better in certain areas like typically men are made with more muscle mass than a woman and women are technically meant to have more flexibility than men and so that's why I guess they're aimed at the separate um, sports so obviously this can have a big impact on um, boys and girls in sport so girls participation levels tend to drop um, as well as their confidence because obviously they're I don't know I guess society tells them that they're not made for um, certain sports and so they think that they shouldn't do it because they don't want to challenge the norms they just kind of want to fit in um, obviously there's less career opportunities for women uh, to play professional sports and even um, when a woman is able to play professional sports, it's usually on quite a low income in comparison to the men. Um, yeah, for example, a lot of like women footballers, they have to um, carry on with like their own working jobs as well as trying trying to uh, train as much as possible as they, they don't get the funding for it. And obviously in certain situations, the quality of play is the same, but for whatever reason, society deems the women's less relevant and so because of that we get less media coverage which again kind of puts in a circle as um obviously the less media coverage you get and the less money they're making for media businesses and then the less money they're getting paid um so there's different um programs in place to try and increase girls participation in sports such as this girl can um, obviously more media exposure for women would mean that they would get more money um, if they were to integrate boys and girls at lower levels to kind of show them that, that they're the same really and not trying to segregate them to show them that they're so different they shouldn't necessarily do the same things um, obviously more funding would allow more women um, footballers and athletes in general to um, to train full time and then obviously the more you're training the better you're going to get and then to educate people so violence in sport obviously some sports are more violent than others typically and there's usually the two categories of spectators and players as to where violence can come in and obviously it's not all um, like physical violence it can be verbal abuse and emotional violence and it's present at all levels of sport so from kind of little kiddies playing Sunday league football you get the parents kind of screaming at the sidelines and getting aggravated for no real reason so here's some reasons for violence in sports so players might be angry at the score which can also um, affect the spectators as well if they're getting quite angry towards the score 
and again for a biased referee can affect spectators and players obviously the nature of the game um if you're playing a more contact sport then there's going to be more violence involved really um a heightened emotion so when an athlete is playing and they're just kind of caught up in the moment i guess that can kind of fuel their anger obviously if an athlete is actually taking any drugs at the time then roid rage could come into it where they just can't really control it and obviously you can get provoked by other players there's a racial aspect which is quite common in football i suppose um obviously losing an important competition will kind of make a player more emotional and then um potentially more violent obviously the rivalry between two teams can have a huge impact and gamesmanship so you know like tugging on people's shirts and just things that aren't necessarily against the rule but aren't uh sporting etiquette and obviously equipment so if you if you're playing hockey or something obviously you have a stick and um that can i don't know i guess can be used as a weapon if you're getting angry um spectators obviously the culture of the sports there's a big difference between like rugby and football um where rugby is much more of a, a kind of a gentleman's game and the spectators uh i guess they have more respect for that whereas in football you kind of get the stereotype of hooliganism and stuff like that um alcohol and drugs cathartic so obviously it can be a bit of a stress release for spectators just kind of getting violent and angry i suppose them getting frustrated at the players and also the segregation of fans can kind of fuel the rivalry i suppose their anonymity which means they kind of feel like they're one in a thousand and so they won't get noticed for doing what they're doing and because of that they have diminished responsibility and yeah just kind of being caught up in the moment so consequences players can be banned booked um their reputation can be damaged and then they can get bad media coverage which could uh, lead to them losing sponsorships potentially losing their place on a team or getting suspended so for example hope solo a um female goalkeeper in um america she lost her team she lost her contract with her team after um there was some allegations about her potentially assaulting someone and also she uh, showed bad sportsmanship towards another team at a high level um so spectators can be banned fined potentially arrested because obviously it's a criminal offence and then uh, criminal punishment so solutions for players having more cameras so you can catch when they're being violent strict rules and punishment educate um, the coaches the players parents anyone involved um, more officials so the media highlighting good players and just encouraging them to be positive role models and for spectators there's no alcohol at certain events such as football you can no longer drink alcohol while you're watching. Um, more stewards and police, stricter consequences and segregation. So splitting the fans up to try and eliminate any violence occurring between the two. So you've got education. So obviously at primary school, um, teachers are teaching sport. They're not really qualified for teaching PE. They're just kind of an overall teacher. And so further teacher training would definitely be a benefit. Um, I mean, it's good because it's kind of introducing kids to kind of the gross motor skills. But obviously, I think it'd be a good idea to start introducing kind of the idea of sport and kind of showing them what's available. And also at this point, you can kind of eliminate the gender kind of factor because at that age, they don't realise that um, certain sports are for boys, certain sports are for girls. So it's best to keep it that way, really. And obviously encourages a positive attitude at that age. Um, Obviously, there's the national curriculum in place, so it does um, require compulsory sport, although at what kind of level, that's kind of a bit wishy-washy. So secondary education, again, teacher training. Um, a lot of teachers will be familiar with certain sports that they've done at school, so then they'll kind of feed that back into the system. So kind of playing the same traditional sports over and over again. And it tends to be more team sports at secondary education, you know, kind of like football, rounders, uh, netball, rugby, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, the national curriculum is still in place. You've got the compulsory sport, but now they also introduce extracurricular activities for students who want to keep going. It's more competitive and kind of developing your skills. So at tertiary education, it's no longer compulsory, but there's some extracurricular activities, although those are mainly picked up by the boys. Um yeah and they usually kind of occur at lunch times and um obviously the fact that they these 
extracurricular activities are put on at lunch it means um well typically lunchtime anyway it means there's a limited time and a small range of sports available because of that um obviously at this point uh people might choose to start studying sports and typically that will be like a more male dominated class and obviously within those classes you kind of develop different peer groups and um kind of at this age you want to start i guess developing your social life so you might kind of go out a bit more and not prioritize sport as much and obviously depending on the group of people you're friends with that can lead to judgment so if you're friends with a not so sporty group of people they might not understand your uh, commitments to sport and kind of judge you for it if you're kind of picking to go to training over going to a party or something obviously at higher education sport again it's no longer compulsory but there's the option to study sport and obviously because it's not compulsory there's kind of less pressure and it's kind of more enjoyable i suppose for certain people but again there's extra curricular activities available these are you know they're run by the students there's a large range of activities you can do when you get to university because i mean there's so many different people there's so many different interests and obviously when you're at uh, university and such um, you've got a lot more free time so that kind of again means that there's time to do different activities that might require more of a setup um, obviously these extracurricular activities they're funded by the university and they've got uh, much better facilities um, obviously there's more opportunity at this point and um, obviously it can go either two ways if you want to go competitive or recreational so obviously if you're going recreational it might be more to develop like your social groups make more friends of com- common interests then obviously there's the competitive side where um universities will offer whole trials and um to kind of obviously get the best team possible and then they can have uh competitions kind of within universities like between teams and within other universities um to kind of add to the competitive aspect um obviously by the time you're at universities you're usually more developed as a person so you're kind of you know who you are as a person and who you want to be so stereotypes kind of concern you a bit less and um also typically kind of as girls get older in particular they tend to do the more kind of individual sports such as maybe swimming or yoga pilates kind of exercise classes those sorts of things which they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do necessarily as they were younger at school and things like that they wouldn't have been introduced to these things so they kind of I guess they find it themselves or kind of through friends and other things and they they can pursue these things as they get older